Good evening, I'm Katie Campbell, Executive Director of the Golden Ball Tavern Museum, and welcome to our lecture series brought to us by the Massachusetts Cultural Council and the Western Cultural Council. Tonight, we welcome Marjorie O'Toole, Executive Director of the Little Compton Historical Society, as she, she shares with us her research on restoring Black voices to local histories. This is an important topic, and we're delighted to have her with us. So without further ado, welcome, Marjorie. Great. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I am going to share my slides. Looks like I've got more than one copy of it open. This is the right one because I spelled historical incorrectly in an earlier version. Um, so again, I'm very pleased to be here tonight and I'm talking about one of my all time favorite subjects. Um, I had the good fortune to go back to school sort of late in life uh, through the historical society to, to improve my history skills. And um, so while I was getting my master's degree in public humanities, uh, I focused much of my coursework on slavery in the North. And this project um, grew out of my coursework um, because I really knew very little when I began and the deeper I dug, the more and more I learned. Let me see what we need to do here. I think I need to click and then there we go. So first of all, um, some of you may not be at all familiar with Little Compton, Rhode Island. Little Compton, Rhode Island is a quintessential New England seaside town. It is a very, on the surface at least, it is a very white community. Um, our most recent census, the number of people, it's only 1.5% of our population of um, 3,600 people. So we have 3,600 year-round residents, tiny little town. Only 1.5% of our population identifies as either um, African-American or Native American. Um, you would not really expect to find the histories of people of color in Little Compton, Rhode Island. But if you start to look, they are there. And it was a wonderful sort of journey of discovery for me um, to realize how richly diverse the community was in colonial times. Um, in 1755, 10% of our population were people of color. And um, through our work, we have identified over 250 enslaved people and dozens more free people of color. So a very um, significant population and a population whose stories really were not told in any with any accuracy or depth in our local histories. And we are a town that loves our local history um, and we have dedicated quite a bit of energy to it in the past. So in 2016, my coursework evolved into a project that the Historical Society um, presented to the community. It was about five years of research in order to, to gather the information. We produced a 300 page book, a special exhibit that was displayed at the museum from um, July through October. And then those exhibit panels were designed in such a way that they could come down and go back up. So that exhibit has traveled all over the state of Rhode Island and to other um, local venues. It's probably been installed about eight times in different places at this point. And what I particularly love about the exhibit is it was a biography exhibit. It presented the biographies of about 60 enslaved and indentured people in Little Compton. Um, and it, it, if I do say my, so myself, it was very moving. Um, at, a, at our exhibit opening, there were people standing in the exhibit area reading the biographies with tears coming down their faces because the stories um, the stories were were that moving. 
Um, we did a lot of public programs, um, including things like this, where we would just talk to other audiences about our work in the hope that they might be inspired to do similar work. And, and we're really proud that our work did inspire um, similar programs in Warren, Rhode Island, in Bristol, Rhode Island, in Jamestown, Rhode Island. So now we have a few communities who've done this sort of deep, deep dive into the histories of their people of color. We installed a slavery memorial in the center of town. Um, and one of the products of this project is that it did greatly expand our audience. Um, we found that we had tremendous community support during the project year, wonderful financial support, wonderful attendance at these programs. There was some negative feedback and that's always people's question. I experienced five negative interactions with people out of an audience of 5,000 people that year. I did the math. That is not statistically significant. And the wonderful thing about that is if something is not statistically significant, you should feel very free to ignore it. And so those five negative things are just ignored. And we focus on the 5,000 people who felt positively and got something out of the project. That being said, it's not easy work. And there are a lot of reasons why organizations and individuals might feel like it's too hard or it's not the right time or, or, or there are obstacles in the way of getting this work done. And so for the first part of my talk, um, I'd like to address each of the obstacles that occurred to me as I was beginning this project, obstacles that I have heard from other organizations, and um, and hopefully um, convince you that they can be overcome with, with time and with effort. So the first is sort of this myth that there were no Black people here. Um, and, and let me say first, you're going to hear me uh, throughout the talk, you may hear me use words that are not normal conversational words. Um, Negro, mulatto, musty, Indian, things that I wouldn't, words that I wouldn't normally use in conversation if I was at your house having, having dinner or cocktails. But I use them on purpose when I speak about this topic, because one of the really important things that I've discovered is that the word, the spe specificity of the word matters tremendously. Different words mean different things in different communities. And you have to learn, do a lot of research to understand what that exact word means in your community. I can talk more about that later. Um, and the different words meant very different things 200 years ago, 250 years ago than they mean now. So for example, Negro and Black meant two very different things in the 1700s. And, and sometimes it's important to be specific about which word you use. Um, New England appears, colonial New England appears to be a white place, simply not true. Um, and again, in 1755, our 10 percent of our population were people of color. You can find hundreds, if not thousands of sources that prove that there was a black population in New England and certainly an indigenous population in New England. So it really is just a myth that there that New England was uh, not a home for people of color. Second is that there are no records. It's like, oh, we'd really like to do this work, but we can't because there's just no records. These people weren't documented. Well, that is also a myth. Um, in Little Compton, we found over a thousand records and Little Compton is tiny. So if we can find a thousand records, larger communities should easily be able to find records for their people of color. The records are not necessarily always written documents. Um, photographs can be records. Gravestones can be records, material culture can be records, and so you pay attention to those things as well. We don't have to do the history because it's already been done. And I have to say, 18 years ago, uh, when I took my job at the Historical Society, 
Um, I was a really good nonprofit worker, a really good grant writer, really good organizer, but I hadn't had a history class since I was 16 years old. Um, and I thought that didn't matter because previous historians had already written the histories. I would just repeat them. But when I looked at those histories and tried to repeat them, I realized they were terribly, terribly flawed and really in need of careful um, examination and in many cases revision um, because they were they were just wrong. So I'd like to share with you one example that was really striking to me. Previous historians wrote that Sylvester Richmond, a slave owner, freed his slaves before the revolution and um, set them up to live freely in the Dartmouth woods. So, and in his probate records, in his will, he says to Nat and Kate, their freedom, 1754. So that's wonderful. You know, Nat and Kate are free. Sylvester Richmond is a good slave owner. He set his slaves free. Um, you know, this is a happy story. Down below in that chunk of text that is really challenging to read, that's Sylvester Richmond's will. And Sylvester Richmond's actual primary source document will tells a very different story. And that story is to Nat and Kate their freedom if they can raise their freedom bond. Now, prior to emancip um, prior to gradual emancipation or prior to um, you know the era of freedom, if as a slave owner, you freed your enslaved person. You had to give your town a bond, and it was a pretty significant amount of money, 50 pounds, 100 pounds, that was the safety net that would take care of that newly freed enslaved person if they became sick or injured, or even if they just decided they weren't going to work any longer, that money would pay for them so that they did not become a tax burden on the town. And that was every town's concern that these newly freed slaves would become a tax burden. So you needed a freedom bond. There is no way that an enslaved person, a newly freed enslaved person was going to be able to come up with a hundred pounds. That's just a crazy thing. Especially Kate, who was an elderly woman, how was she gonna earn a hundred pounds in order to secure her freedom? So we do not know what happened to Nat, but we do know what happened to Kate because of other documents that we've found. Um, Kate could not raise enough money to, oh, and if they don't raise enough money for their freedom bond, then they become the property, the real honest to goodness, sellable, disposable property of my son, Perez Richmond. Kate could not raise the money for her freedom bond. She became Perez Richmond. Richmond's property and she got sick of it and she ran away and the re and we know her story because there is a runaway notice um where Perez is trying to recover Kate um and it, the wording of it tells us that she's probably hiding somewhere in the nearby community um and Perez wants these people to give Kate back to him so huge difference between our inherited history of Sylvester Richmond being this wonderful guy who freed his slaves and the reality that Sylvester Richmond freed his enslaved people only if they could raise their freedom bond. They failed, Kate failed to do that. And so Kate remained enslaved until she chose to self-emancipate herself by running away. Huge difference between the old story and the new, much more accurate story. And that's why we have to do this work because there's such a, a chasm between the old and the new. So another huge obstacle, slavery and racism are too controversial. You know, we're just not gonna take it on because it's gonna cause problems for us. And I think a lot of organizations are fearful about that. And having attended quite a few conferences, I think um, those fears are greatly heightened for organizations in the South compared with organizations in the North. I think Northern 
historical organizations have it much easier. In reality, um, the program, the project just went beautifully. The community was more than ready to learn, more than ready to accept this work. And as I said before, attended our programs and our exhibits, um, record numbers and donated funds to support the project with at a record rate. So, um, so we, um, we did not have to worry. In the beginning, I was even concerned perhaps my board would not agree to let us do the project. Um, I have numerous 90 year olds on my board. I have the descendants of slave owners on my board some very conservative people on my board. Um, we're all town residents. We all have to take into consideration what our neighbors think about us. And, you know, are they going to get angry and withhold their donations from the society? You know, what's going to happen if we take on this controversial subject? The reality was there was no need to worry. Um, I did not drop this idea on the board all at once. They knew I was going to school. I always talked with them about my coursework on slavery. I shared my term papers with them. Um, they had probably heard about slavery um, and indenture, forced indenture in Little Compton for several years before I suggested it be our topic in 2016. And then I sort of, when I did, I sort of braced myself for discussion and questions and you know, making a hard decision. The entire board agreed unanimous, unanimously to have this topic for 2016 with no discussion. And I don't think I've ever been more proud of them for making that decision so easily. Maybe our organization is too small and we just can't take this on. Um, well, we're a little bit bigger now than we were in 2016, um, but it's it's hard to be smaller than the Little Compton Historical Society. Um, at that time, I was the only full-time employee. Um, you know, we're kind of open in the summer and closed in the winter time. Our budget at that time was about $175,000 a year. Um, we're pretty small and we managed to do it. And we managed to do it because um, because I put in a lot of extra time on my own. It was my my school work as well as my professional work. Um, uh, and because my board members function as staff, um, I saw Shelly Bowen on here earlier. Um, Shelly's a board member. Shelly's also a wonderful graphic artist. Um, Shelly worked on this project like it was a, her real job and um, donated her time. And that's why we're able to accomplish what we do because we have these great volunteers. Too expensive. Um, it wasn't really that expensive. And the money poured in. Um, foundation supported us, people supported us. Um, can't remember if it was $500. I can't remember how much money it was to get in the book, but we set like a, a threshold to get your name in the book. Um, and, you know, we ended up with with two or three pages of sponsors in the book because everybody, people, let me say this, people who would normally give us $100 if the threshold to get in the book was 250 And I think my name's in there and I know how much I normally give. So I'm going to say maybe it was 250 Um they they gave more so that they could have this recognition in the book. And so finally, and this is probably the hardest thing to overcome, the, the obstacle or the thinking that you are not the right person to take on this work. And, and I'll share some of my thoughts. I'm not the right person because I'm not the right race. But I can collaborate. And I collaborated with... Um, African-American families on this project. I collaborated with Afro-Indigenous families on this project, and it worked out really well. And now those folks are part of our regular ongoing audience, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, when I did this project and when I wrote the book, I was in a, a master's program, but I had a bachelor's degree in biology, right? So um, a far cry from a PhD in history. 
I don't have that level of education, but I have wonderful people around me who do have that level of education. And half a dozen of them are always willing to help me when I reach out to them. So I personally am local, but let's say you're a retired person living in a new community and you're not a local. I think as long as you truly care about the community, you're the perfect person to do this work. Um, and then, of course, there's a first time for everything. You know, I had not done this work before I started to do it. I got better and better at it as I went along. Um, there's a first time for everything. And anyone who is truly interested and truly willing to put in the time can easily do this work. You do have to have good eyesight or at least good glasses, though, because it is hard on your eyes. So ending the obstacle section of the presentation. I think we are the right people. Our organizations are the right organizations, and this is the right time to do this work. And one other thing, um, part of the Little Compton Historical Society is the Wilbur House Museum. So I work in a house museum. One decision my organization made long ago, long before me, is that they weren't our mission is just not telling the story of the Wilbur House. Our mission is to tell the story of the whole community of Little Compton. And that opens up all sorts of wonderful possibilities for us. We are the only historical organization in town, so that kind of makes it easy. Um, if we only talked about the Wilbur House, we probably would have closed 20 years ago. But because we can talk about all of Little Compton, all aspects of Little Compton, history and culture. Um, it provides us with the, the breadth and the variety to really keep people interested and engaged. And so we don't have to tell the story of just people of color connected to the Wilbur House, and there was one. We can tell, we can and we should tell the story of all the people of color throughout Little Compton. And that makes it a much um, bigger, more interesting project. So we're sort of done with obstacles. Um, uh, you're more than welcome to type questions into the chat. And I know the folks from the Golden Ball Tavern are, are monitoring that. Would they check and see if there's any questions that it might make sense to answer now, um, you know, before we move on to talking about um, best practices for doing this work? Well, so far there are no questions in the chat, which you are welcome to put one in if you'd like. Okay, so let's move on. Um, we're all done talking about why this is hard and hopefully I've at least started to convince you that it's it's not so hard that we shouldn't at least try. And so now if we're gonna try to do this work, um, here are some of the best practices as we move forward. So presenting your histories. So I think the first and most important thing is that when we write these stories, it's really important to make the people of color the main characters in their own stories. So for instance, let's start like with the wrong way. So the wrong way would be you know, Captain James Smith of Little Compton um, enslaved two people and their names were Solomon and Violet, right? Well, that sentence structure makes the white slave owner, Captain James Smith, the main character. We want to flip it so that the enslaved people are the main characters. So that same sentence should be Solomon and Violet were um, an African-American couple who lived in Little Compton, Rhode Island, you know, in the 1750s. They were enslaved in the home of Captain James Smith, right? You're sharing the same information. You can't ignore James Smith. He's an important part of the story, but you don't put him first. You know, he has to be, he, ha he gets to be the tangent this time instead of the other way around. Really important to try and be objective and neutral when you're telling hard histories. Um, and this using quotations is a 
wonderful way to convey some of the hardest information. So rather than me try to explain to people, you know, the awfulness of the treatment of some of the people of color that I encountered, I would use a direct quotation from the document, um, you know, to talk about the beatings, to talk about, um, well, there in in particular, I'm thinking of a, a terrible instance where a man was beaten to death in, in, in the town nearby. That would be a hard thing to write about, but using the wording from the primary source document got the point across, sort of got the horror of it across. And it wasn't me saying it. It wasn't my opinion that it was horrible. People can just read it for themselves. Documentation is extremely important. Um, footnotes, everything, every all the primary source documents are footnoted. Um, that really makes it hard to argue with the information that you're presenting. You know, if a if a descendant is upset that you're calling, you know, their ancestors slave owners, if it's documented, if it's right there in the probate documents, if it's right there in the colonial newspapers, it's really hard to argue with that. You're, you're not the bad guy. You're not making up bad stories about, you know, these, these 17, these 18th century people, you're sharing proven documented fact. Always a good idea to meet people where they are. Everyone has a different level of experience with this. Um, we found that very educated well-traveled, sophisticated people in Little Compton absolutely had no idea that there was slavery in the North. And it was really hard for them at first just to wrap their head around the fact that there were enslaved people in our beautiful little town. So it took a while. We tried to meet them where they were and they, they came along with us. If you are going to add the story of slavery or forced indenture to your historic site tour, you need to make sure that the people giving that tour are really well trained and really well supported when they share that information with visitors. Um, and you have to follow up with them to make sure after their training, they're telling the story in a way that is um, accurate and um, in the way that you want, you as the representative of your organization want that story to be told. Um, I discovered that one of my docents was telling the story of the um, Sakana Indian girl who was forcibly indentured into the Wilbur House, um, and and there and then again telling the story of slavery in the community, and he would follow it up with the phrase. And by the way, there were white slaves too, um, which is not something uh, I taught him, which is um, by um, by academic historians is uh, not believed to be a truthful statement. It was something he decided to do on his own. Um, and he was not invited back the next year because he wasn't someone that I could train that out of him. Um, so there's going to be good training at the front end and a lot of um, supervision and observation at the back end to make sure that you're telling the story um, accurately and people's own uh, flawed inherited histories or own um, inaccurate perceptions are not coming through the tours that they're given. So best practices in research, and this is my favorite thing. If I could go hang out in a vault with town records and vital records four out of five days of the week, I would be a very, very happy camper. So the beginning of the project, good idea to define your scope. What are you really interested in? Where are you going to stop? What will your resources allow you to do? Are you only interested in slavery? 
Are you also interested in indenture? Is that voluntary indenture or forced indenture? Are you going to tell stories about emancipation? How about racism? Free people of color. <laughs> I can't read one of my words. I'm sorry, because it's behind the picture. Um, might be abolition. Um, Indian slavery, African slavery. What's your geographic area? So where and when do you stop? So for Little Compton, geographic area is the easiest, right? I'm literally not allowed to spend my time studying anything that doesn't have an impact on Little Compton. But I will say this, with the stories of people of color, um, I have to go beyond my boundaries because especially since they tended not to be property holders, they didn't just live on one farm for their whole lives, the rest of their lives, they moved around. And so a big part of my challenge is to follow them as they moved around. And sometimes they moved a lot farther than I would have expected. And it was a lot harder than I thought to, to tell their story um, once they left the boundaries of Little Compton. Um, one of my professors, Lynn Fisher, um, was was sort of adamant about the impossibility of separating African slavery from indigenous slavery. I fully believe that statement. Um, you will find people of African descent and indigenous people enslaved or in some form of bondage in the same household. I, I think if you only talk about one race, um, you're not really doing the story justice and how they interacted and lived together is a really important part of the whole the whole unfreedom story in your community. Um, indenture. I really liked talking about slavery and indenture at the same time um, because again, those stories are are woven together. We had, you know, enslaved people whose children were indentured. Um, and it's, it was hard to separate them, and I think a better story when they were combined. Um, talking about emancipation is great because at least there's this little like ray of light in the stories that you can tell. Um, free people of color, their stories are important because at some point, but for example, we had this a free Negro man, um, James Phobes, who owned one quarter of a windmill in Little Compton in 1727. That was shocking to me when I found that document. 1727, there is a free black man in Little Compton who owns part of a windmill. I never would have expected that. That was really important for me to find and I think really important for me to tell James's story. Um, Little Compton was considered an abolitionist hotbed in the 1800s. So I wanted to tell that story too. Um, so there's a lot. Um, racism was something I decided to talk about at the very, very end of the project because I thought it was a way to help tie this information into what was happening in the present day. Um, that was probably the scariest chapter to write because I'm talking about people, the actions of people that we in the community still remembered. Um, and my my board, my advisor said, no one is going to be surprised that their grandfather was a racist. Um, and that's I think that's a true statement. And um, I think that was an important chapter in the book and something um, important for us to be open about addressing. So, Approaches to research. I think it's fair to say you can look anywhere that you might find traditional white records. Um, this sounds awful, but it yields the absolute best results. You look at every page. Um, you get a probate book for the appropriate time period. You know, you get a probate book for the 1700s and you look at every single page and you skim that page looking for the word Negro and looking for the word Indian. After a while, those words jump off the page at you. Um, sometimes it's just Indian corn. 
Uh, other times it's a forcibly indentured Indian boy or girl. Um, but looking at every page is going to yield much better results than just trying to uh, work from an index and picking and choosing what pages you look at. You'll find things in the most surprising of places. When you do look at the index, you can look for common black names. And this is a, this is a very real thing. White names and black names were different from each other in the 1600s and the 1700s and the early 1800s. You can look for Negro or black as a last name. Certainly you look for people with only one name. You know, this sounds strange, but it works. You look under the letter Q. Many enslaved people had Q names. Very few white people had Q names. So this is a way to find people of other races. I also found that the first names, or in some cases, the only names of people of color in Little Compton, Rhode Island, were different than the first names of white people. White people in Little Compton did not have the name Jack, or Phyllis, or Jeffrey, or Prince, or Violet. Only Black people had those first names. Also names like Caesar, Fortune, um, those are, uh, and, you know, uh, Fortune is an aspirational name. Fortune's owner thought that Fortune was going to increase his fortune. Um, names like Caesar are poking a little fun that this lowly born enslaved child is somehow going, you know, is somehow compared to this great Roman emperor. Um, same with Prince. Um, so the first names are different and you get used to them. They're so first and talk about local differences because this is very local history. There was not one woman, one enslaved woman with the name Violet in Little Compton, Rhode Island, but there were about 20 enslaved women in Tiverton, Rhode Island, which is the town just to the north of us. So Tiverton enslaved women were Violet frequently, Little Compton was not. In uh, town clerk record books, sometimes there is literally a black section. The white vital records are here. And then at the back of the book, there's three pages of black records or Indian records. And you again, you flip through and see if you can find those special sections. I've even seen books turned upside down and the records for the people of color sort of are from the back upside down going into the book. Um, one other approach that I found very helpful is to go public with this work early, let your community know that you're doing it, and community members, if you ask, community members will share things with you. Um, some of these records are in private collections. I had people bring me their grandparents, great-great-grandparents, freedom papers. I had the descendants of slave owners bring me the receipts for the enslaved people that their ancestors had purchased. Those records are not part of the public record. They're private records. And I never would have saw, found them or I never would have seen them except that those community members were willing to share with me because they knew early that I was working on this project. Management. Um, I loved working with an Excel spreadsheet. Every single time I found information regarding a certain person, I would add that to the record. We have a thousand, a thousand entries in that Excel spreadsheet. It is super helpful when I was writing the book because everything about Sarah Peabody, an enslaved woman, was all in her section and I could read, you know, the five or six times that she appeared in the records. I take pictures of the documents and when I take pictures of the documents, I put a note in the picture um, so that when I'm back looking at my phone for those documents, they don't all just look like the same thing. I can see quickly where the good stuff is and I put the 
citation or the the source on that little note so that later when I have to write a footnote for it, it's all right there and it's not a struggle. I name my digital files with something searchable, like the name of the people that I'm interested in. And I really try to have good digital files. And, and I think because I'm the age that I am, I also really, really like paper files and I find it easier to work off paper files. Online searches are marvelous. You'll need a, a subscription or a temporary subscription to some historic newspapers. And how do you search? You search for names. Um, the names that are typical of enslaved people um, and, and they're listed here and you can see them. Last names, you search for the name of the Native American tribe that lived in your community various spellings. And for keywords, your community, so Little Compton plus Negro, Little Compton plus Apprentice, Little Compton plus Runaway, and see what kind of um, results you get. Um, and you can do this search with historic newspapers, Google Books, the Haffey Trust, um, Internet Archive, different databases, and, and um, Ancestry.com. Censuses first, right? That tells you which white families had people of color in their homes. You learn those names, and then those are the names that you spend the most time studying or focusing on. So this is Weston. This is the 1790 federal census. And instantly you see that Isaac Jones, who I believe was the owner of the Golden Ball Tavern, has two people of color living in his household. And his next door neighbor has one person of color. Um, and then on the far right side of the document, there are some um, free families of color. Um, so we have free families of color in 1790 living independently in Weston. And then we have households, white households with people of color living in those households. Now, emancipation in Massachusetts is a very tricky subject. And some people will say that the court cases and so forth of um, 1783 ended slavery in Massachusetts. But there are wonderful scholars, including a woman named Joanne Pope Mellish, who is really sort of up there in Northern slavery, argue very convincingly that it is, it's a, it's a myth that slavery ended in Massachusetts in 1783. And instead, it was more of a gradual process because not everyone knew of or understood that court ruling in 1783. Not everyone honored it. Now, some of the like the proof that slavery was over in Massachusetts is this census where there are no slaves listed in Massachusetts in 1790. But it is becoming more and more accepted that the census was essentially fixed. Um, the man in charge of the census was a man named Jeremy Belknap. And again, this isn't my scholarship. This is Joanne Pope Mellish's scholarship. Um, Jeremy Belknap was in charge of this census. His granddaughter later told a story about how her grandfather um, trained the census takers to essentially bully the white householders into saying that the people of color who lived in their homes were free. And if they said, no, no, they're slaves, the census takers would say, are they really slaves? Nobody else in the community has slaves. And the phrase was um, particular. I, I think that's it. Are you, are, are you, are you sure you want to call them slaves? Because you'll be the only one in your town who has slaves. Do you want to be particular? And so they all said, oh, no, no. Okay. You know, they're free. Um, so, 
again, not my scholarship, but according to some of the best slavery scholars in New England, this census is not to be believed. Probates. Probate documents in general are my all time favorite documents for finding um, proof that enslaved people existed. We're familiar with wills and the wills are really important, but we'll talk about the other types of documents you're gonna find in a probate book that give you additional information. So this one says, this is a, an emancipation in a will. So I give unto my Negro man named Quaco his freedom for himself you know, at my death. So this is um, this is where you can find Quacko's name, maybe for the first time or the only time ever. And you know that he was freed, you know, upon the death of his master. So super valuable. So what else do we find in probate documents? We find inventories. These are lists of what someone owned upon their death. In these lists, and here in this example, right in the middle, um, you can see uh, to two Negro men valued at 400 pounds. Right? So here is where we find human beings listed as pieces of property, just like furniture. You can see the word hammock right above Negro men. You can see the word saddle right be below Negro men. So these are someone's belongings, very clear that the that the men are their belongings and they're assigned a value. You can learn a lot from this. Um, and it's really important to look at the wills and the corresponding probate inventory to both, um, because sometimes you'll get the name in one and not the name in the other. Sometimes in a will, it will say the rest and residue to my wife or the rest and residue to my son. So it doesn't mention specifics, but then in the inventory, you'll see that in that rest and residue, there are human beings and you can find their names there sometimes. Um, and the value, the value is very important. And if you are making a database, it's very important to put the value in. Um, value changes over time. You know, what a pound was worth in the 1600s is different than what a pound is worth in the 1700s. But it also, at times, indicates the age or the ability of the enslaved person or their potential for work. So sometimes children are very valuable because there's a whole lifetime of work ahead of them. Um Sometimes, and this is heartbreaking to me, sometimes you see that an aged Negro woman has a value of zero, right? She has no more monetary value because they're just not going to be able to get any work out of her. I mean, that's a hard thing to see. Um, it also helps sometimes to tell the difference between whether someone is enslaved or someone is indentured because the value, so you will find indentured people in an inventory as well. You don't own the person, but you own several years of their life. And, and those values tend to be less than the value of an enslaved person. Black people, people of color, ha sometimes have their own probate documents. So it's always worth looking up their names to see if you can find their probate documents. And there's, there are a wealth of information because you'll learn their family members, you'll learn about their belongings. Um, this is London Richmond of Westport, Massachusetts, 1815. It tells me who his daughters are. It tells me who his friends are super valuable document. And just as a side note, it's always fun to look at who the witnesses are. Um, Paul Cuffey is a very well-known um, African indigenous man, um, the sea captain from Westport, Massachusetts. He was the wealthiest person of color in Little Compton at the end of his life. It, no, pardon me. Um, the wealthiest person of color in New England at the end of his life because of his his um, the ships that he owned. Probate documents also 
uh, are record the forced indentures. So this is when the town council uh, is, takes someone and forces them to work in someone else's family. And this happens um, most often with children who don't have um, fathers uh, available to support them. So you see a lot of children of color being forcibly indentured or bound to white families to work until they reach the age of adulthood. Probates also contain ordering out, ordered out of town. And this often happens to people of color who the town feels they don't belong in the town or they can't support themselves. And they send them back to the town where they were belong, where they were born, or the town where they had established themselves as residents so that that town can spend its tax dollars on them instead of Little Compton spending its tax dollars on them. Okay, so not probate any longer, but town council records. This is a wonderful way to see problems, indentures, and manumissions, people becoming free. Um, once in a while, you get lucky with an index, Sometimes you have to read every page and reading. I, I'm a fan of reading every page. If you can, um, if you can afford the time, even if you did a decade at a time, it would be, you would learn so much. Vital records, well worth checking, sometimes very helpful, much less common for people of color to have vital records than for white people to have vital records. Mostly you're going to see marriage records, very, very few birth records, very, very few death records. Um, sometimes they are in completely section different sections of the book. Um, one way to find vital records for people of color is to look up the wealthiest, the, the last names of the wealthiest white people in the community, because those are going to be the people who could afford to own enslaved people. So if Smith is the wealthiest white man in your town, you want to look and see if you can find Black people with the last name Smith. And um, just, just for context, about 20% of Little Compton's white families owned enslaved people in the 1700s. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a pretty big percentage. Um, look in poor farm records and... When you're looking at these records, you want them to look like the picture on this page. You want the paper to be yellowish. You want there to be no lines. You want the handwriting to be challenging like this. If you're looking at records on white lined paper with beautiful 19th century handwriting, that is a very clear indication that the original records from the 1700s have been transcribed. And when records are transcribed, a lot can be lost. We had a wonderful town clerk in Little Compton, or a very prolific town clerk in Little Compton called Otis Wilbur. In the 1840s, Otis Wilbur took all of our records and he rewrote them in his beautiful, easy to read handwriting on beautiful white crisp paper. Otis purposely uh, chose not to include people's race when he um, rewrote those records. So on the when fortunately the town saved the original records. So I can look at the original records, which are really hard to read, or I can look at Otis's records, which are really easy to read. In the old records, you know, it clearly says. So and so is a Negro. It clearly, clearly, mm, clearly says that so and so is enslaved, is the slave of so and so. Otis took out all the slave words, and he took out all the Negro words, and now you have no idea what color these people were. So he literally whitewashed the records, and you can't trust his work. You can't. You cannot rely on what he wrote, you have to go back and look at the originals. Court records can be fascinating. Um, 
lots of different things. You often see people at the worst moments of their lives in court records because that's when people go to court. Um, sometimes if there was a problem, the court records contain a lot of um, supplementary information just to support the case. And in this case, um, it's a bill of sale for 18-month-old Samson. You know, born in Little Compton to an enslaved woman at 18 months old, he sold to the Shaw family. Um, you know, again, there's a lot of heartbreak when you find these records, um, but it is it is fascinating. And if you look, you you will find things. On a on a funnier note, there's a a court. Well, it's not funny. Um, there is a family in Little Compton called the Head family, and they're a white family. And they were very naughty. Um, they were here from the 1600s, and the the boys and the girls kept getting into trouble. So the boys, the teenage boys, stole the uh, beehive that belonged to the minister's wife. And they went to court, and it was this whole big thing. And clearly they did it. But in the end, they blamed it on their enslaved man, Jeffrey, and Jeffrey's the one who got in trouble for it. So, um, you know, humorous that these boys are stealing the minister's wife beehive, but not at all humorous that they can get out of it by blaming their enslaved man. Visit archives. Um, ask if there are finding aids. Ask the staff if they can help you. Again, look for the folders pertaining to your town's most prominent families. That's where you're most likely to find enslaved people. Um, this is a list of the slaves purchased by Nathaniel Briggs off, you know, when he was in Africa um, on one of his slaving voyages. Um, see, and really do ask the staff, you know, when I go to Newport Historical Society, the archivist there um, just brings things to me. I don't even have to ask him. He says, oh, you need this and this and this and this because he knows I'm working on slavery. So the, you know, the archivist is your friend. Personal collections, again, reach out to your community, see what they have. This was, this document is in private collection and it's a rental agreement for two enslaved men named Aaron and Moses. In Little Compton, there was not enough work to keep your enslaved men busy in the wintertime. And so some people rented them out. So these men were rented out to a shoemaker in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and then in this document, they're rented out to a ship captain and, you know, they go off on a voyage. Church records. These are our congregational church records. On the left-hand side, you see the diagram of the, the pews. And in the lower right-hand corner, you see a little box called the Negro seats. So we know that people of color sat in that pew at the congregational church. And on the right-hand side of the page, in the center of the page, you see these are um, baptismal records for adults, cuff Negro. Toby Negro, Guy Negro. Um, these are these are folks getting baptized into the church. Historic newspapers. Um, we talked about this a little bit um, earlier. Um, can be a wealth of information. Photo albums. Going through photo albums, and all of a sudden, in a predominantly white community, you see a black face. That's a fascinating thing to, to focus on and see what you can learn more. Military records in fold three. Um, these Boston Wilbur and Simon Sukhanush, uh, African-American man, a Sakana Indian, um, both served in the Revolutionary War. And this is a good way to learn about um, men of color who with military service in your community deeds. You don't really think about deeds, but you can learn from them. We have quite a few Indian deeds in Little Compton. We can get many, many names of Native American people from them. We also have a few 
people of color in Little Compton, a few a few African American people in Little Compton who owned land, and um, at the very least, it tells us where they lived. So that's that's of interest. Gravestones. If you're lucky, you'll find gravestones for people of color in your community. We do not have any. Um, well, and they, so our people of color were buried with um, non uninscribed field stone markers, no words on them. What we do have are several graves of white men who died off the coast of Africa. And that is a huge hint that they were slave traders. And so it's interesting to try and learn more about them to learn about the slave trade in your community. Maps can provide a lot of information. This map shows us the location of Primus Collins's houses. Primus Collins had two houses and this map shows us where both of them are. And again, the archive. Um, this, these items are from our own archive in Little Compton. Um, challenging subject matter, minstrel shows. And if you look at the one that says Sakonic Golf Club, almost at the end of the page, it says coon songs. I wasn't even familiar with that term, but clearly it's a, you know, it's a racist, um, racist reference, um, sort of proudly advertised on the golf club flyer in um, 1888. You know, who knew that that was the sort of entertainment people in Little Compton were enjoying at this time. Um, hard subject, um, but um, one one phrase that I remember from a conference with Ruth, Sim Ruth Simmons at Brown University, um, she repeated to us over and over again, the truth is unassailable. So if you're telling the truth, don't worry about the consequences because telling that truth is its own reward. Artwork, here's Primus's house. You know, how great to have a picture of what, Primus Collins was a free black man who lived in Little Compton um, in the, he was, he was born during the revolution and lived into the 1800s. Um, he owned, he purchased land eight times. So again, that's not something you would think of for a man of color, but Primus made eight land purchases and ended up with a really quite nice farm in Little Compton. Archaeology, and I'm a big fan of archaeology. I think it's so much fun. Um, we have done archaeology on a couple of cellar holes of for families of color and have learned quite a lot by doing that. And that's my research advice. Um, this is my email. More than welcome to reach out to me if anybody has any questions after the fact.